Ja, ja. According to Don Norman's classic book, The Design of Everyday Things, a good object has two properties, affordances and signifiers. For example, this mug affords me the ability to carry hot liquids safely, and it signifies that it can do that by its shape and the material it's made from. Also, I just know what a mug is. It's like the sliding bolt on a bathroom door. It's such a simple machine that you can just look at it and figure out how it works and therefore what it's for and how to use it. But some modern bolts are entirely embedded within the door, so it's not immediately obvious whether they're locked or not, and which way you have to turn the handle to change that. So the really good ones introduce artificial signifiers to make sure it's clear. For example, this lock, which makes it very obvious when it's locked, because it would be physically impossible to open the door with it in that position, regardless of where the interior bolt is. And software is like a modern bathroom lock. It doesn't have a shape, it doesn't have a mechanism, it doesn't have a material. It lives or dies on whether its designers have put enough artificial signifiers in to make sure that you know how to use it. For example, this thing affords me the ability to turn off the lights, but there's nothing about its shape or size that signifies that it should do so, and so it has to tell me verbally from time to time. Hey Google, add beer to my shopping list. Sure. That's on your list. By the way, you can always ask me to turn the lights off. Just say, hey Google, turn the lights off. And let's be honest, if I wanted something to respond to every simple request with a little mini lecture about itself, I'd date men. The classic example of doing this wrong is a door that looks like it ought to be pulled but actually needs to be pushed. Usually it's because it has a graspable handle on it. If you put a handle on, people will instinctively try to pull it. And if you add a sign saying push, nobody's going to read it. The solution is to take the handle away and add a brass plate, which physically cannot be pulled unless you're a Dalek. As a general rule, if you find yourself writing instructions for a door, someone hasn't done their job. The signifiers in software tend to be buttons and menus. It's obvious you can save if there's a button that says save on it. Sometimes we use skewmorphisms, so the calendar app might physically resemble a calendar. And otherwise we just use conventions. You know that copy is on control C because copy is always on control C. But back in the 70s you couldn't do this stuff. You couldn't have a button or a menu or physically resemble a calendar because you didn't have the graphics to do it. And you couldn't use conventions because there just wasn't enough of a software to establish them in the first place. You just had to type the command you wanted the computer to run and the computer would tell you why you were wrong. If you wanted to learn which commands were available, you just had to read the instructions. And it sucked, but it was better than nothing, which at the time was the alternative. And sometimes you needed to edit a file. And that meant using the text editor that ran in this command line interface. And the first of these was called Ed. Designed less to be user friendly than to make it technically possible to edit a text file on a teleprinter, Ed was, and still is, a goddamn nightmare. It loaded the file into memory, and then you had to type in commands to change it. If you wanted to know what the state of the file was, you had to specifically ask for it. It was like dictating your file down the phone. And over the years, Ed begat M, begat N, begat X, begat Vi, begat Stevie, because Atari developers cannot not make something cute, which in 1991 begat Vim. In that sense, it's been in continuous development since 1973, which is nearly a half a century, and the result is a breathtakingly powerful heap of garbage. 
Here is how you edit a file in Vim. First, you move the cursor to where you want to go by typing in the amount you want it to move into an invisible text box, and then press one of the four direction keys, which are H, J, K, and L in some order, who even knows. And then you press D for delete, type in the amount of characters you want to delete into the invisible text box, and then you press one of the direction keys to tell it which side of the cursor you want to delete. And then you press either I or A to enter one of the two presumably different actually typing things in mods. You type your text, and then you press escape to go back to command mod, press shift semicolon to bring up a visible text box, type WQ, and hit enter. Vim is a text editor that boots into a mod where you cannot edit text, and with the confidence that only a white male software engineer could muster, calls this mod normal. It has all the affordances you could ever want, and doesn't have a single signifier at any stage. It's entirely controlled by arcane keyboard shortcuts that you just have to memorise. Here are some of the more common ones that it expects you to know. And at this point, somebody will turn up to try to induct me into the Church of Emacs. Emacs, in case you don't know, is a sort of medium-sized operating system in which an enterprising user could, in theory, build a text editor. It's got a few more signifiers than Vim, and even a kind of help system, but it still runs on this needlessly complicated internal model that you have to understand in order to master it. I knocked out of Emacs when it tried to teach me about something called the Kill Ring, coming soon to Netflix, so I'm going to gloss over it here. Suffice it to say that Emacs is also needlessly complicated, and responding to I don't like Vim with try Emacs is like responding to you're standing on my foot by shifting to their other foot. Sometimes, on a dark, dark day, I actually do have to edit text in the terminal, and on most days, my go-to is Nano. It's easy-ish to use, and it tells you how to quit right there on the screen. And okay, so it's not a good way to do a complicated find and replace, or quickly edit something online 1000, but in real life, it's fine for nearly everything. So practically speaking, I use Nano for nearly everything, and Vim for the last 2% of complicated jobs, and it bothers me that that is my choice. Usable, or powerful. Because if I switch away from the terminal, I have Sublime Text, or Atom, or VS Code. All of these things offer power, but with accessibility. The simple features are right there in front of you when you open them up, and the complicated ones are discoverable through menus or searches. I want that, but in the terminal. And I don't see why we can't have it, because... Well, like, we had to invent computers before we could invent the internet, but having invented the internet... You don't actually need the computers. The Discworld's Clax system runs perfectly well on Semaphore, and they were able to invent that, because while they don't have our technology, they do, through the author, have our knowledge. I even did it in light mode, because light mode is better. And I don't see any reason why terminal text editors can't look like this. But the Vim enthusiasts do. I suggested something like this before, and they told me, most stuff requires you to read the manual. And I'm sorry, but hard disagree. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild does not come with a manual. And if your text editor is more complicated than The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, take a step back and redesign it. You can't reasonably expect mouse input in the terminal! I think I can. Because there's already a terminal text editor that has it. And it's Vim! I know, I was as surprised as you are. I genuinely did not know until I started writing this video that all this time, Vim has had mouse input. All you have to do is press shift semicolon to bring up the weird text box and then type set mouse equals A. And you can just click where you want to go instead of having to fire your cursor at it like the most boring Worms game since Worms forts under siege. Menus and toolbars can't exist in the terminal. Oh boy. You see, I lied earlier. It's not that there aren't any good terminal text editors. It's that there aren't any in Linux. Allow me to introduce the greatest terminal-based text editor the world has ever seen. Microsoft 
Quick Basic from 1988. To be clear, I am unironically and without sarcasm and in all seriousness telling you that the version of Quick Basic released by Microsoft on DOS in 1988 is by any reasonable metric a better piece of software than the versions of Vim or Emacs released 30 years later. Look at it! It has scroll bars and menus and mouse input that's turned on by default. It's got this dialog box of find and replace, which in Vim you have to do by typing in regular expression syntax. Although, I mean, at least the box you type them into is displayed on the screen, so that's something. And it had all of this stuff in 1988, three years before the first version of Vim was released. I might reasonably ask why Vim was released. Quick Basic even has the same standard keyboard shortcuts for copy and paste that Notepad had. I mean, like the 1988 standards, but nevertheless, in Vim, copy is called yank and mapped to Y, while in Emacs it's called kill ring save and mapped to control W, while paste is on command Y because they call that yank. Just as a general rule of UX design, don't come up with the keyboard shortcut first and then name the feature after it. So the question is, if we've known you can do this for 33 years, why hasn't Linux done it? And I don't even mean to replace Vim, why doesn't this exist at all? And I think the answer might be that Linux doesn't want it. See, there's a certain class of nerd, all of whom use Linux exclusively, who are just fine with the way Vim is. They don't mind learning pages and pages of arcane keyboard shortcuts to avoid using a mouse for four seconds, because to them the arcane keyboard shortcuts are kind of the point. They're not even trying to edit code, not really, they're speedrunning it. They don't want easy to use software, they want IRC and dark mode and a single line of size 8 text for width of their 56 inch curved gaming monitor. Because if you let just anybody check their email without even generating an SSH key pair or optimising their bash profile then how are you going to tell the real developers from, well, women? If Linux fandom is a religion, then Vim is its shibboleth. I mean, I'm not saying it's on purpose. But the effect of having Vim as the default text editor in a Linux distribution is to set a trap throughout the operating system to catch users who don't belong. Once caught, you are made to feel increasingly stupid for not being able to program your way out of what you presume must be a text editor, until eventually you turn off the system and boot back into Windows and stare there. In your lane. And given we've had mouse control in Vim this whole time, but it's a secret, kind of feels like it might be on purpose. The developers of Vim have known it's hard to quit since forever, and they have chosen not to add a quit button. When people say Linux is hard to use, shit like this is what they mean. It's arcane and weird, and sometimes it's arcane and weird by design. I once saw a friend trying to teach his partner Python. As a first step, he made sure she could use Vim. I even heard him say, and I don't want to see you using the arrow keys, use the home keys. And I wanted to, I didn't, I wanted to go over there and say, just use a graphical text editor. And while we were out, it's a graphical Git client. The Python is exactly the same and you don't need this extra layer of complexity. And if anyone judges you for using friendly tools, you don't need to care what they think. Linux's software as it is filters out people who aren't willing to put up with this nonsense. And its culture filters out anybody who wants to fix that. And as long as only people who like or tolerate Vim are allowed to be Linux developers, things won't get better. Because the people who think that Vim's interface was an outdated piece of garbage in 1991 are exactly the people who should be developing our software because those people know what good software looks like. It is not the two million people who have read this Stack Overflow question, who need to quit Vim.